right, hi everybody. Welcome to Home Safari. We are joining you today from the Zoo's Research Facility, which is the Center for Conservation and Research of Endangered Wildlife, or CRU for short. Uh, so my name is Lindsay. I am a staff scientist here. Uh, my job title is Theriogenologist, which can be kind of a mouthful. Um, so the boring definition is that's a veterinarian uh, who specializes in reproduction. Uh, but I really love uh, word origins. So Therion is Greek for beast, and Genesis means to create. So my job title roughly translates as beast maker. Um, and I think that's actually a pretty good summary of what we do here. Uh, our mission is saving species with science, and so often that has to do with reproductive sciences. Um, and so what I want to do today is take you on a little tour of our research building. Um, please, please, please ask questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so we'll start out here. Let me introduce you to my lovely co-worker, Charlotte. So Charlotte is a black rhino. She is the latest part of our public exhibit. Um, so typically in the summertime, we are open to our guests. We invite them to come. They can see a little bit of our building, get an idea of what we do. And so what Charlotte's here for is to help teach the public how we're using science to save rhinos. So probably very appropriate for Mother's Day, when you guys, um, before you were born, um, and your mom found out she was pregnant, she would go to the doctor. And when they go to the doctor, the doctor uses a machine called an ultrasound, right? You might have heard the term sonogram, it's the same idea. And so your mom would lay down, they'd put some gel on her stomach, and then they could use this machine and actually look inside and see if you're there. Um, and what's really cool is this all uses sound waves. Again, it's called ultrasound. And so this little machine shoots out these sound waves and they'll bounce off of things and some come back and some don't, and that's how we get the image. So if you can see right here, this is an ultrasound I did of a domestic cat. I think we can all see, whoops, just give it a second again, it's on a loop. There we go. So this technology works in humans, it works in cats, and it certainly can work in rhinos, but rhinos are just a little bit bigger than your average human. So black rhinos are about 3,000 pounds, and the trouble is those sound waves just can't get all the way in. And so if I were to take an ultrasound probe and try to ultrasound Charlotte, I can't see anything. And so what we do instead is something called transrectal ultrasonography. So we're just using the natural opening of the GI tract. And for those of you that have been watching these home safaris for a while, you probably got to see a lot of really cool training that our keepers do. And this is no exception. And so before we can come in and work with these animals, the keepers have to form a really special relationship and do training so that our rhinos feel safe, they feel comfortable, they know what to do, and we can all work safely. But what's cool is, once this training happens, we can come in and we can perform this on one of our rhinos. And I'll admit, we do cheat. We do give them lots of yummy food uh, to help them along. But what this looks like, we can go in. I don't know if you want to look at the screen. So depending on where I go, so right here, what we're looking at, if I can make it stay, there's the baby. And I don't know if you guys can hear that sound, actually the heartbeat, so we can actually hear the sound of the special ultrasound. So that's a baby, if I back up a little, now we're looking at an ovary. So we can also use this to see where the female is in her cycle and see if she has follicles, if she's ovulated, those sorts of things. And so what's really fun about Charlotte is when our public exhibit is open, people can come and they get to be the scientist. Um, so they get to be the actual ones who get to perform the ultrasound. And just between you and me, I find the kids are much better at this than the adults. Um, so this is the public exhibit. I think what we'll do is we'll just go around the corner. Um, I'll show you guys some more of crew. So as we go in, this is the way our scientists would typically come in in the morning. Um, and then what we're looking at is our cryobio bank. And you guys can tell I love the origin of words. So cryo means cold, bio means life, and then bank means, right, to store something. And so what this is, is a way for us to preserve genetic material. So we can actually freeze things, and then we can thaw them, and they're still alive. And the reason we do this is because our populations in the wild, um, as the numbers go down, we're losing valuable genetic material. 
Just like every human is different, every animal is different, every plant is different. And if they die before they can reproduce, those genetics are gone forever. So, so much of what we're doing is just trying to preserve those genetics for the future. So down here we have about 80 animal species represented and over 200 plant species. Um, we focus on a few different species. We tend to focus on cats, that's my area. We focus on rhinos, of course, you just met Charlotte, and we focus on polar bears. But I mentioned plants. Plants is an area that surprised people. Of course, remember we're here at the zoo, we're not just a zoo, we're a botanical garden. And just as plants play really important roles in the ecosystem, so do the plants. And so the plants we focus on here are exceptional, meaning they aren't your typical plant. You can't just harvest their seeds and grow them. We have to do special tricks to save their genetic material. So on the animal side, when we're freezing things, it tends to be sperm from the males, eggs from the female, or we can actually collect sperm and eggs, put them together, and do what's called in vitro fertilization. And you might have heard of this in humans. Um, and we can do the same thing and produce embryos that we can also freeze. Now on the plant side, again, these are the exceptional plants. Maybe they have seeds we can save, probably not. So a lot of what our plant team does is look for other materials. Is it shoots? Is it spores? What other material can we freeze um, and save? And so that's what's down there. You'll notice it's in these really big tanks. So within those tanks is liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is super, super cold. So it's minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, to give you an idea of how cold that is, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So minus 320 degrees. And the reason we do that is because if we can freeze them and keep them frozen, then they're gonna be really safe. Um, we don't know how long these samples are good for. So the first animal that had its sperm frozen was just the domestic bull. This was back in the 1950s, um, and we can still thaw these samples, and they're still viable. So we don't know how long they're good for, probably not forever, forever, but certainly um, within the near future. Um, the other thing you'll notice is these tanks aren't hooked up to electricity, right? So for those of you watching that are from Cincinnati, you know we're an old city. We often put some pressure on our power grid. We have power outages. And so if these relied on electricity, every time that we had a power outage, these samples would thaw and then they would freeze again. And that's really bad for them. So by storing them this way, that we're kind of protecting them from those sorts of issues. Um, and again, hopefully good for forever-ish. Um, do we wanna do some questions or we can keep going? We had a couple of questions about the, the rhino. Sure. Um, but they were mostly about What's the difference between a black rhino and a white rhino? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I will tell you guys, rhinos are not my specialty. Um, they have, they both, the black and the white rhino, both live in Africa. There are two African species. Um, and it's basically how they eat and the shape of their face is how you can tell them apart. Um, this is the part where I'll get really nervous about committing to facts and I'm going to get told later that I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure it's the white rhinos that are more square and the black rhinos that are more pointed. Um, additionally, we have three Asian species of rhino. So the Sumatran rhino, um, which is a very important species to the Cincinnati Zoo, um, using that technology I showed you guys with ultrasound, um, we were able to help our Sumatran rhinos here naturally breed. That's really important because they're critically endangered in the wild, less than 80 left. Um, and we had Sumatran rhinos in zoos for a long time and they hadn't bred in over 100 years. And it was our director here, Dr. Terry Roth, using this technology, using things like watching hormones, watching behavior, to actually put them together, and we produce three calves here at the Cincinnati Zoo. So that's the Sumatran rhino, and then we also have the Indian rhino, or the greater one-horned rhino, another Asian species that we work with a lot, that we've been able to produce pregnancies, again, using assisted reproduction. Um, in that case, it was actually what we call artificial insemination, so taking sperm from the male and depositing it in that female tract, and using ultrasound, where we can actually visualize what we're doing was key to that. Um, and then there's the Javan rhino, which again, another critically endangered species. And that's pretty much exhausted my rhino knowledge, so <laughs> <laughs> no well, more rhino questions. Here, here's one about the cryobiobank. <laughs> sure. Uh, Mary wants to know if you've had a hatchling from the 1950s eggs. 
a hatchling from the 1950s egg. So back in the 1950s, um, it was more um, sperm that was frozen, and it wasn't actually performed here. It was other scientists that kind of led the way on that. I wish I could tell you, I think the oldest sperm that we have used here to produce a pregnancy was a palace cat that was frozen in the 90s. Um, and this was just in the last few years we were able to do some pregnancy using artificial insemination. And, um, actually, I think that we had a domestic cat artificial insemination that might have been even frozen a few years before that. And I think that's the oldest sample we have that we've used to produce a pregnancy with. Pamela wants to know what the rarest animal that you have worked with. The rarest animal I have worked with has probably been the Amur leopard. So this is a subspecies of the leopard. Um, they're, they're not... The African species, we always think about leopards being from Africa. These are actually from like Far East Russia. Um, there are less than 100 in the wild. We don't know how many are left. We actually have more in our zoo population. We have about 200 individuals here in the US. The Europe has a very strong population as well. And so that's a really great example of how zoos helped as an insurance policy against the wild. So our populations here are actually doing better than they are in the wild. Uh, one more question. Sure. How many animals have you created from the frozen cryobiobank? Oh, that's a good question that we should know the answer to. Um, let me think about this. So I should say we also work with domestic cats. They're a really great model for a variety of human diseases. We work with a lot of universities, so we'll bank down these samples. I know we've produced a lot. <laughs> I'd say 20 to 30, maybe even more kittens from that. Um, with our with our cat populations, we've probably had. Oh, this is where I'm going to hear about this tomorrow in my staff meeting about how I don't know the answer to this question. I'd say probably ten to twenty successful pregnancies. Again, with rhinos, I'd say our Indian rhinos have been successful. We've had several good pregnancies using frozen sperm. Um, unfortunately, no success yet in the polar bear. Hopefully, we'll get there. Um, yeah, I haven't given you a number, but. <laughs> I think we have time for one more stop on the tour. If you sure. Um, yeah, we can just come over here. We'll do the postdoc Hall of Fame. So I do like to highlight this part. Um, this is the crew postdoctoral alumni. So postdocs are persons who have completed some sort of advanced degree. Often it's a PhD, so they're learning how to do research, but it can be a veterinary degree, a medical degree, and then they need specialized training. So I think it's really cool, one, that the zoo is also a botanical garden. It's even more rare to have a zoo that's a botanical garden and has a research facility. And I think it's even more rare to see all the training that goes on here. So these are all the individuals that have come through the program. This started back in 1997. There's been 19 individuals so far that have completed it. Um, we work with a lot of these folks still to this day. They come from all over the world. Um, Brazil, Spain, Australia. Um, and so it's just a really great opportunity for people. Uh, so for example, this is Dr. Jason. He is the reproductive, um, he's the director of reproductive sciences at Omaha Zoo. And we work with him a lot with a lot of our cat species. Um, where is Erin on here? Dr. Erin. So this is who heads up our polar bear program. So she was a postdoc here first as well, and myself. So if you want to see what I look like without a mask on, um, I was also a postdoc here for three years before finishing um, and now being a peacemaker. So I think that's about all the time we have for today. Um, so for your guys' home activity, um, as I mentioned, our mission is saving species with science. And guess what? You guys can help too. So what I want you guys to do is to put on your scientist hat for the day. I want you to make a scientific poster um, about an endangered species. So pick your favorite animal, pick your favorite plant, do some research, use the materials from around your house, um, and just make a poster. Um, so get creative. You can check out our Facebook page for tips on how to make a conservation poster. But remember, as a scientist, public education is a big part of your job. So share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with us. I would love to see what you guys come up with. So I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy Mother's Day. Um, and don't forget to come back tomorrow for another episode at 3 o'clock.